Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another virtual museum lecture presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia, and we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. My name is Adrian, and I'm the Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm so excited to welcome our very special guest, Brock University Librarian Emeritus Colleen Beard, to present her historic Welling Canals Mapping Project this evening. Thank you for joining us for the lecture series, everyone. We hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and also spark imagination and exploration of our city's rich history. Exploration is the key word for tonight's presentation. If you're joining us for the first time, <clears throat> excuse me, why not go back and view all the other lectures that have been presented in the past year? Can you believe it? Uh, you can catch uh, the over 20 lectures on our playlist, Virtual Museum Lecture Series on our uh, YouTube channel. A quick reminder for those of you watching, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, mobile uh, devices this evening. Please check your audio settings in the YouTube app if you're having audio problems. You may also not have access to the chat box depending on what uh, uh, device you're on. So just, uh, you can also post your comments in the, in the video underneath and we'll try to get those as well. Speaking of questions, uh, tonight's presentation is very different and Colleen and I have chatted a bit about how it will work. If you have immediate questions about something Colleen's doing right at that moment, I'll pipe in and ask. Otherwise, we'll try to save most of the questions for, uh, for the end for Colleen to answer. So hopefully we can, <laughs> we can uh, it might take some practice. We'll see how it goes. So just bear with us and, and practice your patience. If I miss a question, I apologize. We'll, get, we'll definitely get to it by the end. Um, <clears throat> so uh, before I hand it off to Colleen, let me just remind everybody of uh, our upcoming lectures. We have two more lectures in this series uh, coming up on April 13th. We're also very excited to welcome students from the Brock University Historical Society to present a mini symposium of recent undergraduate work. And uh, we've also decided to launch their annual journal publication, The General, that evening as well. So that'll be a very exciting and very different uh, evening uh, that we're in store for on April 13th. Uh, on April 27th, we'll close out the winter session of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series with a very special guest, author and historian at the Canadian War Museum, Dr. Tim Cook, who will give a talk about remembering the Second World War and his new book, The Fight for History. And we're already working on a lineup for the fall of 2021. We've committed to the fall of 2021. We're very excited. Mark your calendars for September 21st, October 5th, Oops, uh, October 5th and 19th, November 2nd, 16th and 30th. Thank you to everybody who made suggestions for the topics for those dates. We're very excited to announce the fall lineup for this series during our April 27th lecture. So you'll have to wait a little bit longer to find out what the lectures will be coming up in the fall. I sincerely hope that everyone has been enjoying our virtual museum lecture series, and I would like to encourage you to make a donation to the museum in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you've come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Give us a call at 905-984-8880 during our operating hours to make a donation. Your donation makes a difference. Thank you. All right, here we go. Colleen Beard is Librarian Emeritus at Brock University. She considers herself a historic Welland Canals advocate and is passionate about preserving and educating the public about our local heritage. Her web application, Historic Welland Canals Mapping Project, HWCMP, <laughs> is an attempt to do just this. Combining historical map resources and digital mapping technologies, also known as HGIS, Historical Geographic Information Systems research, uh, the system has resulted in a showcase of canal remnants and a historical glimpse 
into the past. And with that, I will hand it over. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you very much, Adrian, and thanks to the museum for inviting me. Absolutely. We're very happy to have it's, you. It, it's always a pleasure to get together with canal advocates or even people that are interested in learning more. So thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I've done this talk many times, um, but this is going to be a little bit different. I will focus on the user, which is you, hopefully, and provide instruction on how to navigate the project so that you can get the most out of what the project has to offer. I am not going to provide a historical narrative on the history of the Welland Canals, since the visual history pretty much speaks for itself, but the history, especially the economic prosperity and the influence that the Welland Canals had on the establishment of the communities, St. Catharines and all the communities between Port Dalhousie and, and Port Colburn, um, these are all well written in books and they're fabulous stories. So this project actually acts as an accompaniment to the historical narrative that gives it a geographic perspective, you might say. So if you are watching this lecture, that means you have access to the internet and access to a web browser. And that's exactly where I'm going to start. I'm going to start from scratch, uh, from a, a Google search. I'll, I'll be using Google web browser. And, and it's quite simple to access. So I'm going to show you. So I'm going to stop my video because you don't have to see me. You just have to... Um, and Colleen, do you want to share your screen? Because so I'm going to share my screen. Yes, all they can see is me. <laughs> Nobody signed up for that. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Awesome. Okay, folks, I'll be on the chat box and enjoy the lecture. Thanks, Colleen. And, and can this go the box? There we go. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much. So I'm going to start from scratch, as I say, and I'm going to type in, whoops, <laughs> historic. Welland Canals. And of course, I come up with the, a list of results and typical Google results, but I'm going to show you how to recognize the HWCMP. And actually, it's right here. Uh, sometimes it's at the top, it gets a lot of activity. But if you come across a number of results that have this, the HWCMP, the longer version of the title is Explore the Gems of Our Local History. So if you see that, that is the correct link. Another way to identify the project is through ArcGIS.com. ArcGIS is a software that I use to generate the web application and, and also use to create the data that I'll be discussing. But also the web app viewer as well uh, tells you that you're at the right link. So I'm going to click on that and the project should load. So far, so good. So once it loads, we have three panels that are showing, uh, the map view, uh, we have add maps and air photo panel, but first I wanna start with the information panel at the right-hand side. It just gives a brief uh, outline of what the project is about. What I wanna point out is this user guide. It's a brief user guide that basically describes what I'm going to describe tonight, but I'm going to describe it in a lot more detail than what the guide provides, but uh, it does provide step-by-step step on how to use the project. So that might come in useful. And then a couple tips, uh, but uh, I will be getting to these in a little bit more detail, a lot more detail. I also want to acknowledge some people that have been instrumental in creating this project. It is an act of love and especially Renee Ressler, who not only has an incredible knowledge of the history of the Welland Canals, but he also did a lot of photography that you will see in the project. And also he hiked, uh, we hiked probably, he was my companion hiker and we hiked probably every inch of the first, second and third canals from lake to lake, either by bicycle, by foot, by boat, you name it. So um, thank you to Re Renee Ressler. And also Renee is the founder of the Facebook group, Friends of the Welland Canal. If you have, 
if you're on Facebook, I absolutely recommend that you join that group. I think it's up to about a thousand members now. If you want to get into discussion and and uh, videos, multimedia and videos and all kinds of information on the well and canals, that is definitely the group to be a member of. So um, I also want to point out um, a couple of sources, especially for the historic photos that you're going to be seeing. Our public libraries have a tremendous database and collection of historic photos, as well as the Brock archives and special collections. Uh, great resources and also some personal um, resources or collections that I've also grabbed photos from John Burtniak, uh, Roger Bradshaw, etc. Um, other resources, the maps data and GIS library at Brock University has been instrumental with um, providing aerial photography and historical maps that you will see as well. And I do believe there is a link um, somewhere on this page, there was a link, but it, down here is the information for accessing the map state in GIS library, a wealth of online resources there as well. Now this panel, every time you see a panel with an X, it closes. I'm going to close it. If I want to bring that up again, I just press the I button and that will bring up the I for information page. So for now, I'm going to close it. my map view window a little bit larger. Navigating the map is the same as navigating Google Maps. I'm using my mouse, I'm a mouse person. I use my mouse to zoom in and out. Um, obviously when I zoom in, I get more detail. Zoom out, I'm typical for a web mapping application. Click my mouse and hold will pan. Typical for using web maps. So this project represents a visual recreation of the historic canals in relation to the current landscape, which this is what makes it unique. Um, the fact that it is a really detailed geographic representation of the historic canals. And another purpose of this project is to capture the location and pictorial inventory of all surviving canal features. So there's a lot of information in here. If you're not used to working with GIS or working with um, web mapping tools, uh, it's always good to get some tips on how to get the most out of the project. So this is what I'm going to focus on. The panel on the left-hand side automatically opens when you load the, the project. And I forgot to mention that once the project is loaded, you might want to bookmark it if you want to look at it later. Um, it's always good to have bookmarks. And also, this button here is a share button. If I click it, it creates a very shortened URL, which is much nicer than this one up here that you see. So if you want to embed that in an email and share with your friends, uh, that's an easy way to do it. I'm going to close this for now. And I mentioned the navigation tool, zooming in and zooming out. There's also the plus and minus that also zoom in and zoom out, um, provide that functionality as well. If you get lost, uh, it can happen. <laughs> if you get lost, don't know where you are, the home button automatically resets the geographic extent that I have set. So at any time, if you get lost, go home. <laughs> these buttons here, this is where the fun starts. I mouse over these buttons and it tells me what they are. A good map always has a legend. All the map features that um, are presented in this project have color coded and symbols attached to them. And these are all the data that I, the geographic data that I have created to present uh, the historic well and canals. And we'll get into that a little bit later. This is the add maps and air photos. And this is where all the fun starts. If you'll notice this bar, this gray bar, now this is a little bit of a weakness of the design, the, the web design capabilities. I'd make it much larger because if you don't know it's there, you might be missing something. But this is your scroll bar. So it scrolls down and there's a lot of maps and aerial photography that we are going to add to the project. And I will show you how to use this panel to do that. 
this button allows you to change the base map. Be aware that the base map is not mine. I did not create that. It is supplied by the software, which is um, ESRI, a company from California, which all universities have access to. It's proprietary. And that is what I used. ArcGIS is really the software that I use to create the geographic data. But it is the base map that is supplied by the software. And you can change it if you like. There's all different options that you can use to change the base map. I'm going to change it to gray. And when I change it to gray, you can see my project on top. And as you can see, it's very detailed coded. And when I change it back, I'll change it back to the default, which is the topographic map. So there you go, it shows streets. And I use a topographic map because the Welland Canal is basically a physical feature. So I use it to, um, as my backdrop um, for this project. I find it best, but there's all kinds of other options as well. And I like this map, especially because I like the names. Some don't have Meriton, uh, some don't have Thorold, some don't have Port Dalhousie. So I like this specifically because it shows the names that are in relation to the Welland Canals. This tool is the swipe tool. This comes in very handy and I will illustrate that as we go along. I've created uh, bookmarks. So this is a tool to go to different sections of the canal and I've created a few of them. So if you click on them, it will automatically zoom to a certain area of the canal. So we're gonna go to Port Dalhousie. We have to visit Port Dalhousie when we talk about the historic Welland Canals. I'm going to zoom into the Port Dalhousie area. And for now, I'm going to click off the canal features. Now, notice when I open the Maps and Air Photos menu, you see little squares, um, check boxes, and you can see how I can check on and off layers. The Weir Pond, for example, that's in light blue, I can click that on and off. And the roots of the historic canals that's in dark blue. Um, sometimes I like to click that off as well because I wanna see the underlying layer. But for now, I'm gonna click off the canal layers and just illustrate some of the well canal mapping features that I have prepared. There's basically two elements to the well and canal information. First is all the roots and features of the historic canals. We see weir ponds, we see weirs, we see locks and bridges, and they're all color coded. So the canal, the first canal is color coded using yellow for the lock. Second canal is red and third canal is green. So you can follow the paths of the each of each of the historic canals just by the colors of the locks. The first, second, and third canal all use Port Dalhousie as the northern terminus. And the first and second canal basically took the same route. I'll zoom in so you can see they use Martindale Pond down through 12 Mile Creek and meandered in through and about St. Catharines, um, down through Shaver's Ravine, uh, Dix Creek to Shaver's Ravine, and then up the escarpment at Thorold. So the first and second, second canal basically took the same route. Having said that, their terminus differed somewhat. Uh, the first canal through Lakeside Park and the second canal through the piers, second and third canal through the piers that are still there today. The third canal diverted um, quite substantially through the north part of St. Catharines and over past the current canal, which is right here, and then looped around what we know is uh, GM. And I will get to that a little bit later. So the canal features data, which is all described here as well. So this acts as a legend in itself. If I click these little brown or, or the gray arrows beside the, the square, 
and expand those, it also gives me um, a legend. Towpath is the orange line, a bridge brown, weir is pink, and so on and so on. So this is the mapping data that I have created. Hours and hours of work has gone into creating uh, this mapping, and I'm still not done. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's an act of love. So that is the mapping of the historic canals. That's not to say that all the features of the canals are there today, far from it. But this is where the canal features comes in. As soon as I click that on, you'll notice a lot of different dots on the map. And the map is peppered with a lot of these dots. So this is a little bit different. Um, this sort of adds to the mapping content. All these asterisks that you see on the map represent me out in the field with my phone. And I can bring up this match, uh, mapping project on my phone. And when I notice a structural canal feature that I can see, I take a what you might call a waypoint uh, with my GPS. And I click it and then I also add um, videos or, and, or pictures. Now, pictures can be seen in two ways. They are also embedded in the locks. Everything is clickable here, but I'm going to click on the lock. These are pictures that Renee has provided uh, for the project. So the locks have pictures and it also has a name of the lock. Um, itself, the canal, which canal it is, and also a description. And I think this is what makes the project unique as well, which is also going to be useful as a historic record, because this is a description of the structural integrity of all the surviving features that we have seen, or most of them. And more to this pop-up window is this arrow tells us that there's another picture that can be seen. So there might be two pictures, three pictures, but this is how, and there's also a bar here, but it just tells you how many images are available in this particular uh, feature. We click, as we say, and it opens in another window. So be aware of that, that it does open another window and makes the picture larger. Now this was taken before it was modified. And this is what is important about doing an inventory, taking an inventory of canal structure or modified. In lock one of the second canal today, we see a performing platform that was built there by the city a couple of years ago, which is great, but it's also good to get a snapshot of the canal without those modifications. I'm going to close that, being aware that not to close the project, but to close the enlargement of the photo. Something else I wanna point out too, is this little arrow at the bottom, you'd never know it was there but I'm going to click it and it is a database. It shows a database of all the features that I have made from the mapping, actually, from the mapping as well as the asterisks. So, and it's a lot of information. These are, to every one, one of these tabs is uh, a well and canal feature. So I'm gonna click on the lock. It provides me with a lot more information than what you see in the pop-up window. It's just too much to put in a pop-up window. It tells me the visibility, if you can see it or not, if it's visible, or what condition it's in, fair, good, excellent. This lock in particular is half buried. And more importantly, if the lock is accessible and if you can see it, <laughs> so because a lot of the, the locks are buried, it gives a description and this is important information and also links to the various photos. So this is quite an extensive database. Not all that detail is available for each of the um, features. For example, the pier, a pier is a pier. There's really not much um, 
about a pier, a canal route, that's just a blue marker um, illustrating where the canal route went. So there's not a lot to say about that, although it is named. So the locks and the weirs have the most attribute information attached to them. So I will close that for now, but just be aware of that that is there. Um, another little bit of a weakness of the, the map design um, that is available to me, but nonetheless, it is there. So that's one way of looking at pictures is clicking on the canal features themselves. And there are some very, very nice pictures that were taken. Another way of looking at pictures is clicking on these asterisks. Now, these are going to be pictures that I have taken out in the field. For example, there are more pictures of the weir, for example. Um, there's another one attached to that as well. And it gives a little bit of a description of that weir. This project is very detailed that I have captured and taken a picture of every bollard that I can find on the first, second and third canals. And that is getting to about over 200 bollards. So that just gives you an idea of just how detailed uh, this inventory is. Okay, some fun stuff. No, so those are the two elements. Um, the information that is attached to the mapping itself and also the information that is attached to the canal features. There's another a couple of features here that I wanna point out. I wanted to embed historical images into the project. And I've done that by these red bookmarks. And I have planted these bookmarks we call it geotagging. So I've put them in places so that if you were standing there back in the day, this is what the landscape looked like. And it was a hustle bustle of ships. And we're looking west across the harbor in what is was probably um, Murphy's at that time. Over here, I want to click to Muir Brothers. So this is a, a picture of Muir Brothers. And this was a, one of the, the biggest shipbuilders on the canal at the time uh, that was in operation for a very long time, 1850s to right up to 1968. So it says, so this is another way uh, that you can, uh, or get a, a really uh, historical, um, for the landscape associated with the historic canals. So an, another fun thing are the special effects. These, there's some special effects um, planted in the, in the project, this one in particular. So there is some fun stuff that lurks under these um, dots. So they're not just dots on a map. This particular one, because it's not an image, the link to it looks like a broken link, but it is not. Don't be afraid to click on it. This is actually a audio of a interview that Christine Robertson and David Serafino um, interviewed Alex um, Bennett, who came over here from Scotland with $20 in his pocket. And he describes that and he worked at Muir Brothers. So this is an audio, it's really interesting. Um, a nine minute audio that you can hear him describe what Muir Brothers was, was like. And you can almost recreate Muir Brothers from his description. So that is a special effect that I have planted into uh, the project. Okay. Stuff. These are the two elements. I could actually say there are three elements to this project. So I, I just what I did there was I just closed um, the the legend to the canal features because I'm going to scroll down, and you'll see boxes of different aerial imagery and historical maps that you can add to the project by clicking the boxes. I get the 1934 imagery. You can see the boats lined up along the pier or what 
we call is a dam of the third canal. And to get a better view, I'm going to click off the Weir Pond, which is the blue, and I'm also going to click off the canal route, which is the dark blue. That went away, it gives me a better sight of the 1934 uh, imagery. But this is this fascinates me because of the activity, um, just to illustrate the activity of Muir Brothers and the ships that went through the canals. At this time, 1934, uh, this wasn't in, the third canal wasn't in operation, but it was still functioning. Um, as a, a shipyard, the Muir Brothers shipyard, and boats came into the harbor at that time. In fact, the 1921 photography shows a much clearer picture of the Third Canal. Uh, and that was in operation at the time. And we can actually see a boat in Lock 7. Now, if I zoom out, the 1921 aerial photography is limited to just the canals. So keep that in mind. However, the 1934 aerial photographer, photography is, the extent of that is the Niagara Peninsula. It covers the entire Niagara Peninsula. So it's quite vast. So this was created, all individual photos were scanned and mosaic together by the Maps Data and GIS Library at Brock University. This can be hours of entertainment. What I'm going to do here is turn on the 2018 aerial photography. And this is the most current that we have available to us. Now, Keep in mind that the 1934 is also turned on, but you can't see it because these have to be, this menu has to be looked at as different layers. Think of it as a, a hamburger, for example, where um, the 2018 imagery is on top of the 1934 or the, the dots or the pickle that's on top of the hamburger and, and the 1934 is the bottom bun, you might say. So all of these layers are in order of how they are represented in the project. However, this is where the swipe tool comes in. So I have the current imagery showing and I wanna view or compare it to the 1934. I click on the swipe tool and if it doesn't automatically say 2018, I can go down to the 2018, I select it. So right away, it gives me half 1934 and half 2018. I put my mouse on the divider, click and hold, and I'm swiping the 2018 photography over top of the 1934. And we can see how just what a what a comparison it is, uh, landscape comparison it is, um, and as I as I say, it can provide you with a lot of um, entertainment <laughs> just by comparing the landscape. One of the really cool things is that we know that the Third Canal went across St. Catharines, but if you drive around there today, you wouldn't know that, but. Looking at the photography, you can still see the scar that has been implanted by the Third Canal all the way through St. Catharines. Now that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. Going back to the Ad Maps and Air Photos menu, scroll down. I'm just gonna click that off, the 1934 off. 19, eight, or the 2018 off. And remembering that I did turn off the canal route, takes up a lot of room. And also I'll turn back on the Weir Pond. One last thing I wanna show here in Port Dalhousie is one of my favorite maps. So there's aerial imagery that you can click on and off. But there's also historical maps. This is a historical map of Port Dalhousie in 1839. And 
it sits on top of the base map. I want to point out how you can make this transparent. This ellipsis here, if I click on it, it gives me a transparency option. And if I take the slider, click and hold, I can make that map transparent. And as you can see, it does hug the same um, sort of shoreline as it did back in, um, back in the time. Uh, which is quite remarkable. Uh, we can also see, I think down here, we can see, and if it doesn't load right away, be patient, there are, they are big files. What now is Henley Island was Brown's Island at the time. And we can also see um, the pier. Um, as it loads, we can see the pier. Now my pier that I mapped and the pier from the map doesn't line up quite accurately, but I use much more current and accurate maps to map my peer than what is represented on this 1839 map, which is rather important. But the cartographic detail that is in this map is quite remarkable, which is why I added it. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're turning that off for now. So that is how you add um, historical content to the map and how you explore, how you can compare different landscapes. To get rid of all this, I'm just clicking on the ellipsis and it gets rid of all of that. I'm going to use a bookmark now and we're going to go someplace else. We're going to go downtown and we also call it the Canal Valley. I just want to point out another layer that I'm working on, actually. It's not complete, but I'm working on it. And going back to the layers, add maps and air photos menu, take my bar and scroll down. I can also use my mouse and I have a mouse roller. I can use my mouse roller to scroll down. There is a layer called industry. I'm going to click on that. And what I'm doing is populating the map with industries that occurred or that were in, uh, that, that were functional in uh, the second canal, first canal era. We see Merritt Saw and Grist Mill, uh, which was in the Wellenvale area um, initially, but he owned many other mills in, in the, what we, what was considered the Shipman um, area. Um, I went to also attaching trying to attach photos as well. For example, Shikluna Shipyard, have to go to Shikluna Shipyard. And here I've identified Shikluna and this is a photo of what it looked like um, back in the day. I'm gonna dwell on Shikluna Shipyard for a minute because uh, right now Shikluna Shipyard, very significant shipyard um, in the 1800s the function from 1840 to 1890 is an archaeological site. And it's a project, a research project out of Brock University, and it's led by Dr. Kimberly Monk from the History Department at Brock. There are five researchers involved. Um, I'm one of them. I'm mapper and data manager. And under this special effects, I'm going to bring up what I've created is, and it might take a second to load. It's a, sort of a, a quick 3D image that I created. And it's going to bring up the 1921 uh, air photos overlaid. And we can see that inner basin and it'll come a little bit clearer in a minute. Oh, and there's a 1875 map as well. So, I'm going to click that map off for a second and I want to just focus on the basin. So I'm using my mouse sort of to create a 3D scene here so you can get a sort of an appreciation of the landscape back then and zoom in if I can zoom in and what we can see here is a very slight image of a boat that is in the inner basin. So there is a ship that is submerged in the basin and basically buried in the Shikluna shipyard. And it is our ultimate goal to unearth that ship. 
in a few years. Um, this is a scene that I have created to give that 3D impression of the landscape uh, of the Old Welland Canal meandering through St. Catharines. So again, that is under the special effects. Again, it shows up as a broken link, but it is not a broken link. So that's the industry layer and about Shikluna ship, shipyard. One in particular feature that I have to focus on is the raceway. This raceway that is identified by a blue line that meanders through St. Catharines is really what Merritt wanted in the first place, a reliable water way um, that provided him with um, power, water as power. And this is the hydraulic raceway, which originates in Meriton. And you can actually walk this. And Renee and I have walked this pretty much in its entirety. Um, in behind Hartzell Road is quite a big valley of where that raceway once meandered uh, through the Garden City Golf Course. Um, so that, um, in itself is a hike. Let's uh, use the, what's my time here? Okay, um, we're gonna use the bookmark and we're going to go to Merit Locks. This is absolutely hiking territory. All the locks from Westchester Avenue, from Lock 5, all the way up to lock 21 in Thorold, or actually that is St. Catharines, is visible, except for one, lock 14. Merritt Trail gives you a proper walking trail that you can view. It's a, a fantastic view of all the second locks, uh, or sorry, all the, all the locks of the second canal. The, a marvelous display of the canal locks. There is nothing that exists the locks of the first canal. Although I have mapped those, I'm still not confident they're in the right place because maps are very few and far between and sometimes inaccurate to map those um, accurately. The only lock that is visible from the first canal resides in Centennial Park and only the cap um, walls remain, although the cap um, is concrete to preserve it. So that's the only lock from the first canal that um, you can view. So this is absolute incredible hiking area. Um, you can also hike in Mountain Locks Park, south of Glendale Avenue from locks 15 to 21 is where the boats ascended the Niagara Escarpment. We also call this Neptune Staircase. And you can get a feel for Neptune Staircase from this historical image. This is Lock 21 and the view all the way down to Lock 16. Neptune Staircase gets its name from um, locks that were similar in Scotland. Neptune being gr uh, Greek for um, God of the Sea, and staircase because that's what it represents. It's basically a staircase for boats to climb um, and descend um, elevation. But Mountain Locks Park is the only park in the city that is designated um, for the historic canals, and it has the most concentration of surviving elements of the historic canals, uh, including views of the canals that are in immaculate shape considering how old they are, almost 200 years old. But also one of my favorite is the picture of this weir remnant, which I was actually sitting up there today. I can't tell you how many times I have um, traveled <laughs> through Loughton, Loughton, uh, Mountain Locks Park. Um, even though there is a trail that hugs the locks themselves, there are many paths inside the park um, that are well-traveled and 
that display some of these weirs that are still visible today. So it's a fabulous place to hike. And just to give you a perspective, um, by the way, Lot 24 was um, unearthed, um, excavated back in 1987. And this is a picture of what it looks like. It's in uh, immaculate shape, being a wooden lock uh, from the first canal. And a lot was learned uh, from the design of the wooden locks because not very many remain. Um, but this image in particular, it shows you just the mass of water that um, came down um, the escarpment. This is a weir, but there are many weirs that um, in this park that it, it just shows you how much um, of how much the weirs had to to manage the water and um, for the for the to maintain the levels of within the locks themselves. So that is an absolute must hiking area. Um, at this point, I want to go back to the layers, add layers, and point out a layer that you will be interested in. This is a series of 75 maps, the second well and canal map five, and it's a mosaic. The maps reside, the paper maps reside in the Brock um, archives and special collections. The maps data in GIS library uh, put these maps together to create a mosaic from Port Dalhousie all the way down to Port Colborne. And it provides a lot of detail. In fact, these were the maps that I used to map the extent of the weir ponds um, in and around uh, the second canal. It's uh, a fabulous resource. Okay, my time. Um, there's a couple things I want to point out. Um, no, uh, no need to rush, Colleen. Lots of time left. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, we have to go to the third canal. As I pointed out earlier, uh, the third canal carved a path through St. Catharines that loops around um, this area here. Uh, just to show you that there is a bookmark to the escarpment canals. It's also called the loop line. You can see that there are a lot of dots in this area. That's because it's very accessible. And also there's a lot of surviving remnants in this area. This is a fabulous hiking, um, one of my favorites. So not only the second canals can be, the locks of the second canals can be viewed um, from lock seven to 21, the third canal locks can also be viewed from lock 13 right through to actually lock 22. The Bruce Trail runs along the east side of this lock system, this, this part of the canal from lock 13 to 16. So it's a great hiking trail and each one of these locks is visible. Um, and can be explored. Just, uh, let's not, I'm going to zoom in here and click on itself. And this is what confirms the idea that we really need to perform a visual inventory of the locks because we can see that pretty soon this part of the lock 14 is going to collapse. So it's really important for the historical record that we do this kind of thing and go out and take note and, and capture um, a visual record of all surviving features of the canal. Whoops, I want to zoom out here. The amount of landscape that was occupied by water is very substantial. And this red marker here, remembering that the red bookmarks here represent historical photos. I'm going to bring this up. So if you were standing here back in the 1900s, this is what it looked like. Just vast, vast amount of water and a weir, uh, lots of weirs um, that were used uh, for um, 
um, raising and lowering the, the, the water management in, in the locks themselves that you don't really see today. Um, so that was that's something to point out. This is a rail tunnel that went right under the third canal. Some of you may have been there. Uh, there is a tunnel that you can go under. But I just want to bring up for this particular area the 1921 imagery and show how it can be used to locate structures. I'm also going to put the 2018 imagery. Zoom in a little bit. So there is the path of the Grand Trunk Railway that went under the Third Canal in the 1800s, early 1900s, so that the trains wouldn't have to stop for the canal at the CN line. Uh, instead, they went under the canal. But we can see that a lot of this area is, is forest right now. But using the zoom or the, the swipe tool, we can see that back in the day, back in 1900s, there was a, a road. This is the old St. David's Road. And I'm doing this because I know there's some people um, snooping around in this area. But there was a whole um, neighborhood in this area called Turney's Corners. And there's a lot of foundations that still remain in this area. It's an archeological dream. Uh, <laughs> and because we can see them on the historical imagery, but we can't see them just by looking at a current image, it's quite difficult to find. But with out in, the, um, in this area, um, with my phone, actually, what I'm going to do is turn off the 2018 and I'm going to put on the 2013 instead because we can actually see a trace of this road on the 2013 imagery. If you, whoop, I have to go under the menu, under the swipe and tell it to swipe the, oops, the 2013 imagery. So I'm swiping the 2013 imagery that's on top. And you can see when I swipe that road, you can almost see an imprint in the current landscape as to where that road is. And we have hiked through that area. And as I'm hiking through this area and I, with my phone and I'm looking at this imagery and I have my locator on, my little blue mark that tells me where I am, I can also locate these foundations, which we have done. And under these asterisk functions of the homesteads and probably Turney's homesteads, something else that is just magnificent. And because this was a road at the time and this was a rail line, there are remnants of the abutments. If you're walking around, along the path of this rail line, which doesn't uh, the rail doesn't exist anymore, but they just come out at you in in the midst of a of a, of the vegetated landscape, like a sci-fi movie. Or <laughs> um, it, it, it's quite remarkable. There's another image here, uh, and they're in an immaculate condition, made of of stone blocks, and uh, they're quite. Um, um, fascinating. So th this is something to explore. However, um, unfortunately, we're not really supposed to be in this area. It is Seaway property. Uh, I'm going to go back and going to my layer menu, I'm just clicking off the 2013 imagery for now. Uh, I'll leave the historical imagery on. Um, we're not really supposed to be hiking in this area because it is Seaway property. Um, however, I've exposed myself now. I've been back there many times and the dots on the map give it away. Uh, but I just wanna point out 
the wing wall of lock 21, which is probably the only lock on the third canal, which illustrates the wing walls um, in their entirety. They are fascinating. And the only time you can actually see this in its entirety, this lock is when the reservoir is drained in the winter. As you can see, this is the winter, uh, winter time. But you can see the flare um, and how they slope uh, from the canal wall. It's just extraordinary. And because we cannot hike this area, um, there's people like Bobby Davidson, who has posted drone imagery on the Friends of the Welland Canal. Um, and it's this is great imagery. It's a link to uh, the drone as they are filling the reservoir just a couple weeks ago, actually. And it gives a really good perspective of what the reservoir looks like. And it also gives an image, an overhead image of Lock 20 and Lock 21. Um, maybe we can fast forward and you can see lock 20, which is buried. It's submerged uh, in the reservoir um, at this time of year um, because the reservoir is very active in regulating the water for the current canal. Uh, so that is why it's very difficult to hike that area uh, this time of year. So turning off the 2021 imagery, um, I just want to point out that when the reservoir is submerged, uh, there is also a ship. You can see the ship remnants, the guts of a ship that was abandoned right at the uh, lock um, entrance, exit, whatever it may be. Um, uh, which can be seen in the winter. But these are other sort of remnants of the canal that become quite interesting as we explore. I have concentrated mostly on St. Catherine's Thorold area, but be aware that the mapping of the historic canals extends from lake to lake. It includes all the mapping um, or the canal elements including the feeder canal and right to Port Colburn, the historical locks, historical piers, etc. So a lot of work has been done to map these elements. Again, not all the elements are uh, on the landscape or visual on the landscape today, but this is how they would have been on the landscape back in the time. Again, the asterisk and dots on the map represent uh, the surviving features. So the historic canals are, they require our respect. Um, there's so much history here and it also requires our attention. The historic canals Catherine's area is St. Catherine's wow factor. And they do uh, require our respect and also um, an inventory uh, for the historical record from time to time. Also, it provides a lot of hiking material. So on that note, I'll conclude and thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much, Colleen, uh, for such an in-depth and explorative presentation of your wonderful project. Uh, we'll get to questions in, uh, in just a second. And um, we'll leave the map up. You guys, everybody knows what my slides look like. So we'll just, we'll leave the map up for now in case there's questions about specific things. Uh, yes. So go ahead and, and post your questions in the chat box. There's a couple of comments we'll go through, um, but uh, yeah, do, do go ahead and post your, your comments and questions. Uh, and while we wait for those, thank you very much to our viewers for attending tonight's presentation. Uh, and uh, for all of you, for all your support this season and the last and the next, 
uh, of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider making a donation to the museum so we can continue to deliver the high quality programming that you expect from us. To make a donation, please call the museum during our operating hours at 905-984-8880. With our wonderful guests, we've now delivered over 20 lectures. So check out the playlist on our channel for all the previous lectures on our YouTube channel and share the playlist with your friends and family. Uh, it's incredible to uh, check out some of the canal lectures that uh, myself and Dr. Monk have delivered already. Uh, and you can check those out and then go and in-depth explore on the uh, Welland Canals Mapping Project. Uh, if you haven't been to the museum recently, why not come for a visit sometime soon? Uh, we are open Wednesday to Sunday while we're in the red level of the COVID controls, uh, but we also have two new exhibits if you haven't been to the museum in a little bit. Uh, the first is Marking Time, which uh, Kathleen, our curator, uh, gave a, a lecture about in December, and we have a new exhibit opening on Thursday, <laughs> uh, it's called Just a Line to Say, and it's all about the postcards from the museum's collection. So do come in, we, we are open uh, while we're in red. So hopefully we, should, hopefully we stay in red or a color and we don't go the other way. So that everyone can come and visit. Uh, we'd also like to remind everyone to please like, follow, subscribe, smash that subscribe button uh, on our social media channels right across, including here on YouTube, to uh, stay in the loop with all of our virtual programming during the museum's closure. Please also share the museum in your own social networks to help more of our community join in the historical adventures. And of course, if you love uh, the deep dive of the Wallen Canals Mapping Project and the lecture series and all of these wonderful, wonderful historical uh, topics, why not try our podcasts? Uh, we have two podcasts, Museum Chat Live and One Hour in the Past. You can catch our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Uh, so do check us out. And now we'll take some questions. Uh, first question is coming from, oh, Kathleen Powell, of course. Hello, Kathleen. Uh, Colleen, is there a way to see what is new in the project since you add stuff regularly? Good question. Um, not really, but I'm always adding stuff. <laughs> but there's no way of knowing um, really what updates have happened. <laughs> I guess since my last update, it's just a matter of exploring. I, I will comment that there's so many historic photos that this is what I'm working on now, as well as photos that are attached to the industry layer as well. But I think it's just a matter of exploring the project from time to time and knowing what you've already seen and <laughs> um, exploring some new content if it comes along. But um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. There really is not really a, a list of updates. No, that's great. Uh, and but, but that is a good question. That's, that's something perhaps I could investigate. Yeah, it, something you could investigate going forward, not going backwards. Yeah. That would be incredibly difficult. Yeah, even, um, if I, even if I put notices in perhaps the information panel, uh, that might be an option mm -hmm. uh, to put information in your, um, last updated or, or new, new edition since so-and-so. That's actually a good idea that I could do. Almost like the uh, suggestion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, almost like the fire insurance plans. You know how... Uh, they glued over like the original map <laughs> instead of making an entirely new one. That's that, right. That would be really, that would be really, really neat. Yeah, um, really Colleen, neat. I have a question actually about uh, ArcGIS and this particular project in comparison to other projects. As if you're, are you aware of, you know, this is the biggest project that I've, uh, biggest GIS project I've ever encountered. It, are there comparable projects? Not for the well and canals. No. No. Uh, there's lots of books, lots of maps on them, on the well and canals. But as far as the historic well and canals are concerned, 
No, this is what makes the project unique. Yeah. That this is the most detailed um, web mapping project for the canals that exists. Uh, there's other GIS data that is available. I think the St. Catharines, the city of St. Catharines, or maybe the Niagara region has created lines that represent the paths of the first, second, and third canal, but nothing that is comparable to mapping these structures, every weir, every bollard, every weir pond, um, and the detail that comes into the roots. And do you know, um, do you know if it's unique across sort of historic sites or other canals? I'm thinking like, you know, do other major historical sites like ours have something, have you encountered anything in other locations like it, like the Rideau Canal or, or um, the Trent or, or railways or things like that? Well, as far as canals are concerned, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm alone <laughs> when it comes to the canals. However, yeah. in terms of historic GIS projects or GIS projects that are, are about history, there's many of them. Um, there's actually a book on historical GIS research in Canada. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that has actually has a chapter on the, the historic Welling Canals. Oh, that's uh, So there are many projects that use GIS to display um, historic content um, in the world, uh, all over the place. Um, so, so it's nothing, uh, nothing, it's, it's relatively new, but it is nothing new. Uh, it's used, uh, Quite, quite frequently, yeah. yeah and we'll, uh, like, we'll be using it for the Shikluna shipyard as well. Yes, of course. It's incredibly valuable for, for historians, um, both sort of as a beginning, as a, as a middle, and as an end to research, which is why I ask because we are incredibly lucky to, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but we're, in, especially now when research is, is so limited in, in availability and accessibility, we are so incredibly lucky to have this resource. Um, and <laughs> I'm sure you know, and I'm sure you hear it all the time, but I think it's important to tell you and thank you for how much work you've put into this, because as you mentioned, it is sort of your project. Uh, and, but I don't, you know, it's, it, I, I don't know if you know how important it is. Uh, and it's interesting because you said at the beginning that you weren't going to tell a narrative about the Mont Canals, but the site the, the website inherently tells a narrative. So, you know, talking about um, Neptune staircase, you know, the, not only the historical uses, but, uh, you know, during the canal's operation, but also the historical uses in terms of the last hundred years uh, or almost hundred years of, um, of, of it not being used uh, and being used as a recreation space uh, instead of a, an industrial space. Uh, and even talking about, um, you know, the purpose of the canal in the first place with such a high emphasis on the raceways, uh, you know, you are telling narratives and I, <laughs> I think it's so, 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 so important. Yeah, um, another thing that it, it, it complements uh, any literature, for it example, really it's okay to read a book. I mean, there's lots of books written on the well and canals and they do describe, they have lots of pictures, they have lots of maps and they describe features and this, that, and the other thing. But now we can, you, you can put a, a map and um, a picture uh, to the geographic area that um, they may be talking about. So this is really never really been done before yeah. as to superimpose the history on top of a, a current landscape so that you can relate to it. People and, know the current landscape, but they can now relate the history to the current landscape. So absolutely. as, as I say, it's an accompaniment to all the, um, the narrative word that is out there. <laughs> For sure. And it, I think what's neat about it is that it's, it democratizes the story because now people can see that the canal or what parts of the canal were in their back that are in their backyards. Yeah. If they're here, they can go and see it. If they're from far away, they can at least zoom in <laughs> as closely as possible or look at some of the pictures that you and Renee have taken and get a, get a sense of it there. So I, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a, a couple more questions. Um, lots of, lots of comments of, 
Um, of course, a world-class project. Uh, also, uh, let's get hiking again. That's from Des. Yeah. Um, so lots of hiking to do this summer, of course. Speaking of hiking, I just want to note too that just watch out for poison ivy in some of the locations that Colleen mentioned, especially in Mountain Locks Park. In the uh, not on the main trail, but on the east side or sorry, I guess the north side of Neptune Staircase, there's a, some patches of poison ivy. So just watch out. That's a, that's a classic uh, uh, experience, poison ivy on some of our trails. And yes. So just, yeah, just heads up on that. Um, is, if I can interrupt just for a second, yeah. this is the best time to hike. It's still yes. dry. The weather is great. Yes. No, there's no ticks yet. Hi. And um, yeah, it's a perfect time to hike. As a matter of fact, I, I very rarely hike in the summer. I hike in the winter because of the ticks. And it, there's also no vegetation yet. Yeah. And vegetation is one of the reasons I don't hike in the summer because you can't see anything. You can't see anything. Yeah, uh, it, it obscures a lot of the structures. So this is a perfect time to get out there and, and hike some of these these places. Absolutely. Actually, our next Lego challenge uh, is coming up next week. And we've filmed now because you can see some of the bridges that we're doing. So we're doing bridges for the Lego challenge. And it's, uh, it's pretty incredible to see everything. When you go there in the summer, some of those trails I only go to in the summer, and you can't see anything. So I totally agree. Definitely a good time to hike. Uh, also, just want to make sure that everybody's safe out there. When you're hiking, wear proper footwear, <laughs> take some water and a person with you, uh, always a buddy to hike and, you know, a phone and that kind of thing to not only take pictures, but just in case something happens, uh, especially exercising some caution on the Bruce Trail sections that are uh, on the third canal. Uh, so just just careful not to explore too far over the edge. <laughs> um, uh, are there any records of methods used to build the canals? Um, Dave Steele asked. There's many, 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 many records uh, from the various uh, four canals. They, they didn't all use the same methods and um, materials and that kind of thing. In fact, lots of different types of uh, people and engineers built the four canals. So uh, that's definitely something that you can kind of explore here on the Welland Canals Mapping Project, but is also a good place to look at your basic Welland Canals book uh, for that kind of information. Uh, and Kathleen asked again, how does how will it work, Colleen, if there's a, a software change in the future? What will it, can it can the site get archived somehow so that if something happens to the software or something like that, that it's still accessible? You can tell that question is coming from an archivist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent question. And of course, anything digital like this, who knows how long it will last? What I can say is the data, the geographic data that I have created are individual layers, GIS data that can be preserved. It is up to me to deposit it and I, and I will be depositing it in probably a national depository um, that will not only share uh, or, or give a, um, a, um, a premise to share it, but also to preserve it. That is the big key. This sort of interactive website that you see here, sure, it can change, but as long as my data is preserved, anybody can take it and recreate what I have rec what I have created here in any kind of web application. So the key here is to make sure that my my uh, vector data, you call it, all the the routes, the weir ponds, and the location of the raceway, and all that kind of thing, and the locations of my canal features, the inventory that I have taken with boots on the ground, all that can be preserved so it can be recreated. So down the road, um, probably 20, 30 years from now, no, you, you, this could quite possibly change and it might not even be around. I won't be around, so it's a good chance this might not be around, but the data itself can be preserved. That's great. And uh, yeah, thank you for talking a little bit about the techno technological difficulties. While technology is so great, it is changing so fast so that, you know, 
things that we experience now may not be possible in the future. But I'm, yeah, I, I'm hopeful that you're right. In terms of the data, the data is preserved, then we're okay, at least sort of okay. Maybe that, the application will be different. But um, Bell really wants me to mention, and I forgot, Bell, there's been so many great comments, uh, Bell, that yours has gone to the top and I can't see it anymore. But um, Isabel wanted me to mention that, of course, the lock gate and the sluice paddle from, or the sluice paddle and the, of the lock gate from lock 24 is here in the museum. Uh, so definitely uh, come and <laughs> visit the museum. I'm actually very excited to use that particular artifact in our in, in redeveloping the galleries in the in the years to come, as a part of our interpretive plan. Yeah, Lock 24. The the excavation of Lock 24 was particularly important. Happened just before I was born, but particularly important <laughs> um, for understanding the uh, the the sort of the finer detail of the construction. Of course, they most of the written documentation that we have about the first canal it comes from the form of complaints of things failing and or not working. Um, and so having the archaeology to support uh, the, the, the remnants of information that we have about its construction are, are really great. Maybe that's Isabel down there in the pit. No way. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I did not I know that. I wouldn't doubt it knowing her. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Right in at the action, of course, Isabel. Absolutely. Well, uh, oh, um, uh, uh, okay, great. So I think we've covered most of our, our wonderful comments and some questions. Again, Colleen, thank you so much for, um, for coming on to present uh, your project this evening. Uh, again, I'll just, I'll just um, say that the project is so important. It's inspired so many uh, so much research and it supports so much research. So everyone at home, give a big round of applause to Colleen and her project. Thank and you um, if you want to get in touch with Colleen, you can do so. Uh, her, she's bravely posted her email on the information panel on the website. And I'm sure she would, uh, if anybody wants to get involved in, in some way, I'm sure she can be in touch with you. Absolutely. And if anybody comes across a remnant yes. that isn't mapped in the mapping project, <laughs> I want to know about it. <laughs> it's true. So uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, everyone. Get out into the field, take your phones or, or whatever device you have with you uh, and enjoy. Go for a hike. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank and you very we'll much. talk to you all soon. Thank you, Colleen. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.